Mr. Clausen, thank you so very much uh, for accepting our uh, invitation for this interview. My first question is about how do you see the scene progressing? And when you look at the Middle East, when you look at Iran, what are your thoughts? Well, the last six months we've seen a series of dramatic changes, uh, starting with uh, the Iranian strikes on the Saudi oil facilities in September, which completely changed the attitude of the uh, Saudi and Emirati governments towards uh, Iran and really affected the way in which uh, governments overall dealt, dealt with Iran by showing that it had much greater capabilities than people thought it had. Then we saw the gasoline protests in, inside Iran, which suggested that uh, anger at government policies uh, was red hot. Uh, and raised serious questions about the stability of the government. Uh, then we saw the death of Qasem Soleimani, which uh, first showed how Mr. Trump was prepared to use military force in a way that was quite unexpected, uh, and then which showed a strong nationalist reaction in Iran uh, that uh, the regime could tap into. Then we saw the shoot down of the Ukrainian airplane, which just wiped away so much of the popular sympathy for uh, the, this nationalist position that had, uh, the regime had been able to tap into. So we've seen a, a whole series of great changes uh, in the region. And uh, that suggests to me that if I were Supreme Leader Khamenei, uh, I'd want to have another such event uh, because uh, it would, he should be looking for some way to restore this national unity and this nationalist narrative and uh, uh, once again assert uh, Iran's power in the region. So if I were Supreme Leader Khamenei, I'd be thinking about how to arrange another surprise. Uh, well, obviously, as far as military capability, does the Islamic Republic have that capability to confront the international community on its own? One of the effects of the uh, Iranian strike on the Saudi oil facilities is that it changed the discussion about what we expect from Iran. And now what we expect from Iran is very precise missile strikes. Uh, indeed, the strikes in Iraq are, are being judged uh, as having been highly accurate and therefore that Iran wasn't trying to kill Americans or inflict heavy damage. Maybe, or maybe they were just inaccurate strikes of the sort that we saw Iran doing until two years ago. But now the expectation has been that Iran would strike very precisely. So anything that Iran does is going to be judged against this very high standard. Uh, Iran now is kind of like uh, the situation that the Americans and the Israelis are in, which everybody expects that their missile strikes will be very exact and precise. And if Iran does that, then people say, well, of course, that's natural. And on the other hand, if Iran isn't able to do that, people would say, oh, goodness gracious, they failed. And uh, how is, what is the policy of the United States as far as the Islamic Republic is concerned and Iran? Uh, we hear uh, and we see uh, this is the first U.S. administration in 40 years to be supportive of the people in Iran and their demand for change. Uh, but at the same time, we hear others uh, in Europe and in think tanks um, and in the press media uh, saying that the U.S. has no strategy at all. What are your thoughts? Well, Mr. Trump likes to be unpredictable. And he is perfectly comfortable with holding completely incompatible ideas at the same time. So his policy, he, which he described as maximum pressure, he wants to see what it will produce. And if it produces uh, regime change, all the better. Uh, if, on the other hand, what it produces is Iran entering into negotiations with the United States for an improved deal, well, he'll take that.
He likes dealing with dictators, and he likes working out her, um, arrangements that most people would say are not very different from what was there beforehand. So, for instance, he bitterly criticized the North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and Mexico, and he negotiated a replacement deal of which he's very proud and which seems to be working for him politically, which isn't very different from what was there before. And similarly in his trade negotiations with the Chinese or what he's offered the North Koreans. So I could tell you all the reasons why Trump may once again use military force against Iran, and I can tell you all the reasons why he might agree to something which is not very different from the nuclear deal he walked away from. That is the question, is, uh, is the pressure on Khamenei going to be sufficient to bring him uh, to do something he do really does not want to do? And the strike in Soleimani raised an, a new prospect, which is to say that American pressure could take the form not only of economic pressure, but also of military strikes. And uh, we have to see whether or not uh, that's going to be the great pressure, which leads Khamenei to drink the cup of poison uh, and accept new talks with the United States. You talked about the New Deal, and certainly, um uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been hinting about the new Trump deal, deal. How much do we know? How much do you know about it? And what what do you think the parameters would be? Well, Pompeo set out a list of 12 maximal demands. Uh, in, but the history of Trump's negotiations with foreign countries is that he sets out maximum demands and then accepts minimal change. Uh, so I think that the, the issues that Trump signaled when he first withdrew from the uh, JCPOA, the nuclear deal, uh, um, which are very similar to the issues which were raised by French President Macron. Uh, namely, there has to be um, some permanent features about a nuclear deal, not just ones that expire, uh, so-called sunset clauses, because they, they go down. Um, second, there has to be some kind of limits on Iran's missile program. And third, there has to be some kind of agreement about Iran's regional activities. Uh, but one can imagine modest progress on all three of those fronts uh, being described by Trump uh, as an enormous change, a big improvement uh, over what Obama got. Um, talking about uh, the regional uh, issues, how do you see events in Iraq and U.S. influence in Iraq or not, Iranian influence in Iraq or not, uh, in the coming? Uh well, there are many in this administration who think that Iranian influence in, in Iraq is so large that uh, the United States really ought to reduce it, its presence in Iraq. And, um, whereas others in this administration say, no, that's not the case, that the Iraqis are proud nationalists, uh, as are Iranians, and that, uh, in fact, Iran's influence in Iraq is easy to exaggerate, and that, therefore, the United States should stay committed in I Iraq, if nothing else, to ensure that uh, the extremist group known as uh, ISIS or Daesh doesn't uh, reassert itself. Uh, so there is already quite a debate in the U.S. administration about what to do, and there's similarly quite a debate in Iraq about what to do, and that uh, nobody in Iraq wants to return to the situation where a third of the country is in the hands of these uh, extremists. Um, and uh, there are differences of opinion about uh, how important it is to have a U.S. role there. My suspicion is that what will happen is that uh, the two sides will continue to make contradictory statements, uh, but that at the end of the day, the U.S. forces will remain in Iraq for quite some time in a limited and training role, uh, supported by this coalition. Not 81 countries are members of this coalition. Most of them don't contribute much, uh, but that it's important uh, to show that this is an international effort and not just a uh, a U.S. occupation of Iraq States. And the view of Mr. Um, Mr. Zaire's position, how has that affected and will affect uh, the foreign minister of Iran's position mm -hmm. at the U.N. in the negotiations um, across the table from 
European diplomats. Well, the Trump administration despises Mr. Zarif and does not think that he is an important figure in the Iranian system. And so if there are actually going to be negotiations, it would be important uh, that the negotiations be with somebody who uh, is respected by the United States. If Iran wants to get something, if they send their Look, if Iran sends a Zarif, that's an indication that they're not really interested in negotiations. They have to have send somebody who is clearly, uh, who the United States thinks is clearly close to the supreme leader and he can and can deliver. Well, I don't know who that would be. Well, actually, you do. I have a number of names, but I'm not. Can you tell us? No, I'm not going to share. Why? It, because it. Uh, um, their effectiveness depends in part on their being a surprise. Right. Okay? And, and I'd like them to be effective. So, um, and also, uh, the nego character of the negotiations, the Obama administration conducted bilateral Iranian-U.S. Uh, negotiations, which were then rejected uh, by the U.S.'s allies in the region and rejected by the majorities in Congress. Not smart. We need to find a format for negotiations which is going to have broad support uh, in both the United States and among its allies, as well as, for that matter, broad support inside Iran by all the factions in Iran. Uh, so we, we will need a new format for doing that. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Clausen, uh, and I hope we have a chance to speak with you. Let us hope. Thank, you very, much. thank you very much for speaking with me.